Hi, it's, uh, it's great to be with all of you today. And um, I'm Nora, and I'm here with Derek and Peter and Benjamin. And uh, we thought we would try this approach of just having a little conversation um, around what is on our minds, what's, what's up with this systems thinking business. Um, and, and what's it like to, to kind of live in this realm and especially, you know, after the last year we've had um, and the, the very sharp uptick in interest in systemic and, and approaches that deal with the complexity of all that is going on and the problems that need to get faced. Um, so I thought I would start us off just uh, with kind of some of my my own reflections around this and what I've been learning. And one of the ways that I have noticed that I come up into systemic learning, the strongest is through my frustrations. And um, whenever I, I come into a, a frustration, it's, it turns out to be something where I'm, I haven't found articulation yet for why this thing is, is rubbing me wrong. And so it, it always becomes a, a good learning for me. And I think one of the things that's come up for me this year uh, is that having grown up in a systems household and basically, you know, I was weaned on systems theory. So I, my whole life is in this realm. Um, but one of the things that has come up for me this year is a kind of a frustration around how this work could be made really mechanistic and, and how easy it is to have the existing ideas in the culture, which are largely mechanistically formed um, kind of leak their mechanisticness into the system space. And the next thing you know, you're strategizing systemic process and, 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 and working with, you know, really not very complex notions of causality. And it, it's, it's easy to um, make a tool out of it and lose the depth and the rigor and the curiosity and the tone of it. So, so for me, that's been something this year that has produced curiosity and also frustration. And just wondering how you guys are doing. Well, I mean, that rings that rings very true to me. And my my sort of <laughs> how am I doing right now is is likely to be very discombobulated and um, scattered because uh, oftentimes that's that's how I'm feeling at the moment um, <clears throat> what I would say is that I, I remember reading that there's a little passage in in um, smaller arcs of larger circles Nora um, the, the, I think it was the thing the main the big thing that stood out for me from from your book was that point about of course systems thinking is interpreted in a mechanistic paradigm because that mechanistic paradigm is all around us what I'm seeing now, um, particularly around the world, the word sense making, because I do choose to dive in and swim in a sea of systems of all of thinking, complexity, cybernetics of all kinds and all flavors a lot and a lot of the time. But the thing that really is irritating, to use your word, me at the moment, is not so much mechanistic application. There's plenty of that still around if you look for it and it gets the hits, um, but glibness. Um, mm. Glibness without playfulness. Um, there are sort of on-demand subscription services for sense-making sessions now. And I suppose we're in one of them. So, you know, uh, we're all part of it. <laughs> <laughs> Meta. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and I think, oh, is that is that right? Is that mm. w when you get a sense making salon that's advertising forty sessions a week and they're dropping half? Uh, just so so. I love and have been afforded lots of opportunities to swim in the deep dark waters of old theory and 
practice and ideas. And there's something special about that for me. Um, just for, so, and, and we're spoiled at the moment. You know, um, the cybernetic society has sprung back into life. Metaphorum has sprung back into life. So all of these old, you know, I've just just come off a call where Professor Mike Jackson was talking about the spirit of the viable systems model. Um, but what the other thing that your intro triggered in me, Nora, was um, what was what was your word? Um, uh, frustrations. And I was lucky enough to. Um, go to a cybersoc presentation about perceptual control theory and method of levels um just a week ago it doesn't matter what they are but the the point that i want to make there was just um allowing somebody to externalize their frustration and be with it for a while and allow the brain to reconfigure itself to that and just like you saying my frustrations give me insights just the concept of that is quite empowering and is probably something God knows we, we don't want to recipify that now, um, but it's probably something that is needed right now for people to say frustration, confusion, mind bogglingness, um, ah, kind of feel because I read the Brexit headlines every day and all of that kind of stuff, which I probably shouldn't do. But actually to say that's the feeling. Stay with it for a moment and allow your person to reconfigure to deal with that. There's something, there's something hopeful, <laughs> if misguided maybe, but something very hopeful about about approaching things that way. I think I'm going to try and take that with me uh, into the next, into the rest of the week at least. <laughs> Peter, you, are you, you might, I can go now if if you want. Um, so. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, really interesting thoughts on, on bo both uh, the previous thoughts that I, I my experience I, Nora talked about her experience growing up in a systems household um, my experience was I didn't really even know about systems thinking or any of that until much later I uh, uh, dropped out of high school and the about the only skill that I had was a as a mountain climber and so for 25 years I was a mountain guide and uh, I think that's where I learned systems thinking was in the mountains. And so my, my training comes from a, a very naturalistic, you know, organic uh, training of being in the mountains 230, 250 days a year in a tent. And, um, and then when I was done with that, I, I thought, okay, what's, what's next, you know? And, and so somehow I ended up being a, a systems theorist. But when I heard about systems thinking, the natural I really, step what the natural step from being a yeah guy. exactly <laughs> it's very forrest gumpian in in some ways but i i had heard about this thing called systems thinking and i um i was very interested in it because it sounded kind of neat and i i really was very curious about well what is it you know what is there a there there kind of thing and i wanted to really deeply understand it and there's this there's a, a children's book um I think it's about a chicken or a duck or something. And he goes around the farm and he talks to all the animals and he says, you know, to the cow, he says, are you my mommy? And the cow goes, no, I'm a cow. And then he goes to the pig and he says, are you my mommy? And he says, no, I'm a pig. And, you know, the chicken keeps going around and asking all the farm animals and trying to find his mommy. And I feel like uh, for a number of years as a doctoral student, I was like that little chicken with systems thinking. I would just go around the world and interview the top systems thinkers or systems people and, and ask them a, a single question, which is what is systems thinking? And I just was very like stubborn about wanting to know that answer. And I really wanted to understand what, what is this thing called systems thinking that everybody talks about. But when you dig into it, it kind of feels very sometimes very hard and hard to grasp. And um, so through that, I, I got interested and in introduced to systems thinking. So, you know, like some of the things uh, that, what you said, Nora, like um, the mechanistic aspect, I probably have a little bit of a different um, take on it because to me, there are mechanical systems in the world. And when you're dealing with a mechanical system, you should be mechanistic. 
And when you're dealing with an organic system, you should be organic. So I think systems thinking can be all of those things. Systems thinking can be mechanical if what you're dealing with is something that's mechanical. And, um, and it, you know, if you're doing rope systems in mountaineering, you know, that it's sort of mechanical, it's physics and things like that. And uh, there's nothing, I mean, there's some organic to it. There's some nonlinear systems inside of it, but, um, and then, and then you, you both talked a little bit about the inconvenience. Um, and, and Benjamin, I, for, I forget the word you used, but it was like inconvenience, uh, frustration maybe. Oh, frustration yeah, as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that's something that comes up a lot. I mean, I think when, when I work today with people and when I work with organizations, that comes up. Um, it reminds me a little bit of a, an old saying in education, which is that if you think education is expensive, try ignorance. And I think mm -hmm. you could kind of change that quote to say, if you think systems change or systems thinking is inconvenient, try not doing it, you know, <laughs> because the system's going to change and you're not. And that's incredibly inconvenient. Uh, and, you know, when you're talking to organizations and things like that, that that are resistant to change, one of the things that you can sometimes leverage them with is, well, this, you know, the, the environment is changing and you can either change or not change, you know, that's up to you. Um, but it's not gonna be pretty if you don't. So uh, whether or not it's inconvenient, I don't know. I think of it as, as an opportunity to change, but, um, and that's something that I think I learned in the mountains because the mountains really don't care if you're inconvenienced, they don't care if you're unhappy, they don't care if you're happy, you know, you either, you either get with the reality of the mountains or you don't uh, and you won't. So I think systems is a little bit like that. Like systems don't care whether you are unhappy with them or whether you don't want to change or whether you're feeling inconvenience, like they're just going to do what they do. And, um, you know, you probably should get with it, but you don't have to. <laughs> I like that. Just get with it. <laughs> you don't have to, but but you probably should. <laughs> you might regret it. <laughs> Who's is the is it Akov? Who's is the survival is optional quote? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and and actually, I just want to be really clear, Derek, that when I'm talking about you know, the, the problem yeah. being mechanistic thinking that I'm, I'm absolutely referring to using, dipping into that mechanistic metaphor process when you're trying to think about living systems. Absolutely, absolutely. And that is making all kinds of trouble. And, and we see it all the time in terms of just, I mean, look in the pandemic year of all the, 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 the just aching for linear causality into mm. the future and into the past and making the future become the past. And mm -hmm. it's, it's, you know, talk about the mountain doesn't care. The systems <laughs> exactly. are changing and, um, and there'll be no, no, no pushing that into, into a mechanistic control. Right. Uh, and well, there and there's no doubt that the, that the mechanistic mindset had a stranglehold on science and positivism for a very, very long time. And, and systems thinking in many ways was historically a, a correction, a course correction of science in being too mechanistic and too overly reductionistic and too positivistic. And in that sense, you're absolutely right. We've got to, we've got to get away from that. Systems thinking was clearly historically that. Um, at the same time, we don't want to throw out the no. value of mechanical thinking, right? Because that's, that's part of the universe. So as they well, say, I mean, totally there's a get, time and a yeah. place for it. Exactly. Yeah. Well, all, all I would say is yes and no, because the other way of looking at it is systems thinking is just taking science seriously, um, because as soon as you look at rationality and, and actually take it seriously, that's why so many great systems thinkers are former engineers um, and so many not so great systems thinkers are former engineers as well, um, uh, because all rationality is, is, is buttressed by um, uh, reasonableness, adjustment, accommodation, adaptation, um, 
and it all exists within a within a more or less coherent conceptual framework but nevertheless it's just a conceptual framework um, that can be proven wrong at some point in the future and that can compete against another conceptual framework to explain the same phenomenon so there is something about systems thinking actually being if you if you get really good at logic rationality science and then you start to turn it just a little bit on itself you suddenly most people run away from that of course because that's the discombobulation that's the breakdown that's the that's the deep inconvenience um some people i think of all those wonderful stories of norbert wiener as the um scatty professor some people just live that way all the time anyway <laughs> um but it, right. it it is a continuation of, I, I, I mean you obviously it was a it was a counterbalance as well but it but it's actually an extension uh, i would say as well how are you going there peter yeah um i'm listening of course um i uh, will respond to the um introduction um just for interest uh, derek um small small story here my my um my university course was mathematics, so I'm probably uh, quite mechanistic in my approach. Um, lots of process there, um, which was what uh, attracted me to systems thinking in the first place. But my university professor, my uh, tutor, was uh, he, his subject was general relativity. But on the other hand, he didn't get to it till he was thirty because most of that time in his life he was a postman. So, so we, we, we arrive at these places from different, uh, from different starting points. Um, you know, we're all here together in, in one sense because, um, you know, we, we, we knew a guy called Gene Bellinger who kind of started a, a group where we all kind of met one another and, and started uh, talking with one another. Um, and, you know, I was, I was always interested in the, in the subject. Uh, very much interested in you know what people had to say. Um, had a learning approach. I, I would say I'm the kind of common, you know, the the, the man on the street here. Uh, from that respect, I had the view that I thought systems thinking was important, and that we, as a community, needed to be able to communicate to a wider community. Mm. Um, and I thought that was really important. And. The, I suppose the, the, the frustrations that I have that would be interesting to, to hear about from the, the, the assembled um, you know, people here who, who've got you know, deeper, deeper knowledge than I, um, would be, I, there's two things. I think, um, I think often uh, the, the education system tends to make us a little bit isolated. It tends to suggest that we have to make our own way in the world. And I, I'm, I, I think I'm still hoping to see more collaboration between people that I know, um, that I've met. Um, you know, you, the path that I've taken is 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 the people that I've met. Um, you know, that's just what it is. But I'd love to see more uh, collaboration, and and that's kind of um, I think that's manifest. You know, in itself as something that. I'd love to see more of amongst the people that I know. Um, but the other side of it, I think, is the is the kind of very bipolar nature of debate that takes place typically in online communities and people get very wedded to the positions that they take. Um, and going back to you know, my roots as a mathematician, I'm looking for patterns. And I'm, I'm also looking for people who have a learning approach to life mm. in that they are able to say, okay, I've taken a position, um, but maybe if there's some fresh information, some new knowledge, and with systems, I mean, Derek, I love, I, I do like your your system of distinctions, systems, relationships, perspectives, and if you, it, and that's a that's a great starting point, and I, I you know, I, I I respect that work, and I think it's it's helpful to people as a starting point, <clears throat> um, but in order to kind of be in a particular situation and listen to other people talking. You sometimes need to to, to think that you, maybe you don't know everything. Well, Socrates would tell us we don't know everything. You know, he he knew that very well. He wasn't very smart about telling people, but he was he he knew that people don't know everything. Um, and we all actually need to take that approach in that we, if we're listening to somebody talking, we don't really know their background, their experience. 
it's worthwhile trying to understand things from their perspective. So I get perspective, 100%. You know, I've had many discussions in communities that I'm in about perspective. And, and, and that would allow more flexibility and tolerance in discussion between people. And I'd, I'd, I'd like to see us collectively um, trying, to, trying to promote that more you know, in, in online communities. And I, I, I'd like to hear what, what the group think about that. Yeah, I'd, 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 to connect what you and, and Benjamin was, was talking about earlier, I mean, it is, systems thinking, I think, is about rationality which a lot of, and logic, which a lot of people might sort of push back against a little bit, certain types of systems thinkers. But it's about uh, it's about a very particular type of logic called multivalency rather than bivalency. And I think mm. if you if you take that that sort of mechanistic or bivalent types of thinking that that Nora was talking about, and you and you imbibe that into a community, then that community is going to be polarized, like you're talking about, Peter, where yeah. you have people digging in on on this side or this side, black or white, up or down, left or right. And um, I think systems thinking has to be a multivalent logic. So it is rational, it is logical, but it's not your stereotypical Aristotelian logic where you have two values, but you actually have an infinitude of values based on perspective. So perspective makes, you know, distinction making is binary, but perspective makes distinctions infinitely gray. And so if we can, you know, if you can build that into communities and conversations and those kinds of things where, where it is, you know, where, where like what Nora and I were just talking about, like systems thinking is both anti-mechanistic and pro-mechanistic. Like, mm -hmm. it, like there's, we should be concerned about mechanistic thinking. And also there are times where mechanistic thinking is the best kind of thinking you could possibly do. Um, that's, a hard, a that's, a hard, that's a hard message for an audience to take on board. Though. Very hard. <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, it's a different kind of of I think it's also Sorry. about a kind of attention and, and, and a, a kind of rigor. And, you know, there's, there's quite a bit of discourse out there and, and a kind of romance with the unknown and with ambiguity. And um, that the, 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 the unknown and the ambiguity that I think that, that gets surfaced in the study of systemic processes is a rigorous unknown. It's not something that's just this, you know, woo that we're going to park over here and it's just going to be mystically revered as the unknown, hmm. which is, it, you know, actually the reverence that I feel for those places where you cannot understand the system, you can't predict it, um, it, it is far greater than if it were just at a, you know, if it were sealed off in the unknown realm. It, it, there's, there's a depth and a, an attention that comes with, with, like you were saying, Peter, with paying attention to where other people mm. are, what, what's the context in which what that person is saying mm. makes sense, is right. What is the context in which this thing is actually how they're learning to be in the world, which is not to make excuses for, but to study and to, to pay attention to. And more than anything for me, I think, to develop the practice of mm. perceiving in that way. Mm. Um, so it's not about, you know, brushing it off. It's actually about going deeper. Mm. It's bloody inconvenient. Um, I mean, that is really a total pain. <laughs> <laughs> it it is be, inconvenient. It would be so <laughs> nice to be absolutely convinced of something and not to have to consider alternatives. And it's so hard not to collapse into a wishy-washy grey middle ground or um, uh, a woo-woo unknown uh, uncertainty, um, if, you, if you see what I mean. Um, uh, but once you're once you know, as Derek said, that I mean, what, what was the, the the they've just completed a new round? I was reading about it this week of investigations into the Russian pass accident high up in the mountains, 
when the students camped overnight and then a few days later they hadn't reported back and people went and found them sadly they'd all died and 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 their bodies were strewn all over one was slightly radioactive they had mm -hmm. these strange injuries their tent was ripped open so um obviously it must be aliens you know um <laughs> <laughs> and um, and they've done a lot of evaluation. They use modeling of the snow from Disney's Frozen movie, um, and they use they use terrific accidents that were that were deliberately carried out by Ford or somebody on cadavers to um, understand the impact of blunt force trauma. Or, you know, and they put this all together. Um, in this incredibly rigorous scientific way to work out that there could have been at that moment a particular incredibly rare type of avalanche that could have had these effects and you can't um, model for that in you know they were they, they were students but they were experienced mountain um, uh, climbers go up as mountain go up as uh, <laughs> and and they were just really really unfortunate and that is the that is the world of uncertainty surrounding wherever we've drawn the barriers of our system to model it mechanistically. There's always the possibility of, of something outside it. And wherever we think we've got our solid ground politically, emotionally, um, spiritually, that there's always, there's always, however big your balloon is, the outside of the balloon just gets bigger and bigger and bigger, doesn't it? And the, and the, the unknown outside gets, uh, gets wider. Exactly. And I think there's this, of course, we're in, a, I think, a, a global moment right now where there is a, a call, a need, a, a, a perception that, that systems change is not only in play, but necessary mm -hmm. if there's going to be any kind of continuation of not only our species, but thousands of, of mm -hmm. others. Mm -hmm. So there's... Uh, I guess one of the inconvenient things is these inconsistencies and these kind of conflicts that occur between the stability of one system and the stability of another system that it is within and where your personal stability lies tomorrow or in 10 years or in three generations. And so I think, part of what, what we're seeing right now is, is, is that kind of tectonic rub of, of these systems that are not actually um, gonna be able to both coexist. So what, where are we going? What does it look like? How do we let go of existing ways of relating, of educating our children, of thinking about our, you know, our, our material assets of thinking about everything from addiction to poverty to viruses is 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 in this weird difficult rub between existing established systems of societies and other kinds of you know the mountain that is doesn't care so what do you do when the organization does care and the mountain doesn't and <laughs> And your survival is in both. You need oxygen and a, and a paycheck. <laughs> so that's inconvenient. Hmm. I mean, we had a survey uh, just, just published recently uh, where um, some, somebody's kind of suggested looking at corporate, uh, corporate uh, productivity, but including the effect on the environment. Uh, and that's not the first time I've heard that, um, but it's the first time I think it's got a degree of publicity. Um, and, and that would be important to, to, for people to try and start a dialogue, a conversation around what that would mean. Um, and, and especially looking at you know, the, the, the capitalization of some of these large corporates, which might look very differently um, were it measured in a, in a different way. Nicely put, yeah. And we have to start somewhere. And I, you know, I'm not one to say where, <laughs> but you know, I'd like to make a start. Well, um, you know, I think again, the systems thinking really is, is I, actually right behind me. Three, three little statues that 
that, are, that remind me of this all the time. It's uh, Dionysus, Apollo, and in the middle, um, uh, uh, Odysseus. And Odysseus is thought of sometimes as the original systems thinker mm -hmm. because he was the middle systems thinker rather than the Apollonian or, or the Dionysian. Dionysus is kind of like a god of partying and you know grapes and wine and stuff. And or what you might think of as right brain and Apollo is the logic and all that kind of stuff. And there's a talk that I give my students at the end of the semester, every semester. And I start out with like, things are bad. And I, and I have like five, 50 or 60 statistics on how bad things are. But then I say, you know, things are good. And there's, there's 50 or 60 statistics on how good things are. And I think you, you've got to find that that reality in the data and in the in the evidence, because, you know, having just lived through the last year in the United States, which where we've had multiple viruses, a virus of stupidity and uh, politics and Trump and and then another virus of, of Corona, mm. um, you know, it it feels like the world's coming apart, but at the same time, if you look statistically. We've ne the world's never been in a better place. More people are in democracies than ever before. More people uh, are born and raised outside of the shadow of crime and violence and war than ever before in, in human history. More people are moving into you know, different economic groups than ever before in human history. So you know, there's, there's thing, there's the trajectory of humanity at a macro scale is going very much in the right direction. And so we don't wanna throw out the baby with the bathwater, as it were. We wanna see both sides. I mean, it is, there are some terrible things, but there's also a, a lot of reason for hope in the, in the global trajectory of humanity. I, I think it's worth giving a little shout out here to Jennifer Garvey Berger, um, who's got a lovely piece out now, which is very timely for this conversation, who's brilliant at just, distilling some of this down to stuff that is um, uh, simple but not simplistic and graspable but not glib etc <laughs> um, and she talks about the mind trap of wanting a simple clear story mm. um, and the practice of holding two or maybe three stories at once and we're sort of trained to go a, a, a lot of our a lot of this um, frustration discombobulation um, inconvenience is actually a layer that we add to the world um, and we're trained to think but surely we can't hold two stories simultaneously that, that, that offer those completely different realities like you just like you just talked about um, Derek um, and yet actually maybe it turns out that we that we just can so perhaps for, uh, uh, this is the last thing I'll say, I think, um, as we, we need to sort of, uh, <laughs> we, we, we've, we've gone beyond our, uh, our targeted limit already. I'll, I'll say my final thing, the, the ultimate um, inconvenience of systems thinking. There's, there's a great, um, I, I, had, I had an ex-partner who was um, uh, Italian um, from, from Rome. And um, they, they had this expression, when you thought you'd achieve something amazing, um, but really you were just stating the obvious uh which is um uh who was the guy who was the greek guy who got out of his bath and said eureka um oh uh, was it pythagoras Aristotle. No. Uh, oh god archimedes uh, yeah, must archimedes. have been archimedes yeah. anyway yeah. Uh, displacement fluid displacement. anyway the point is he's naked running down the street going eureka 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 and one townsperson turns to the other in the street and says what's he on about oh he's discovered water um so <laughs> if you spend enough time in your bath you discover water and that for me is the <laughs> the ultimate inconvenience of, uh, of systems thinking Um, well, I, I just wanted to, uh, again, just say thank you and that this was really fun to have a, just a brief dip in the, just a little tiny dip into the big ocean of systems thinking and a little slice of just what's on our minds in this moment. And uh, I hope we can do these more frequently and just come in with some little tidbits. 
So uh, maybe until the next time, we can just sort of sign off for now and and uh, do it again soon. Sounds great. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.